Um, Lee Pauser is going to be our speaker, and he's going to be talking about what, what he has found in small and standard sized nest boxes. Lee is a longtime member of the California Bluebird Recovery Program, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and the North American Bluebird Society. For many years, he has been collecting nest box data and submitting it to the Cavity Nesters Recovery Program and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Nest Watch Program. And in fact, he was actually just really recently featured in the Nest Watch newsletter, which highlighted that Lee had uploaded over 2,000 nest records. So that's really incredible data. And I also want to remind you that today's program is part of is part one of a two-part series. So be sure to register for next week's talk as well, because he'll be continuing it there. So Lee, thank you again so much for joining us tonight, and I'll have you go ahead and take it away. But yes, I'm Lee Pauser. Thank you, uh, Serena, for uh, the introduction. And uh, today, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, talk about the birds that I have in my small and standard nest boxes. And those are different names for the chickadee and the bluebird nest box. So this is me, a uh, little introduction. Uh, I retired from IBM after 31 years. I build, maintain, and monitor uh, nest boxes on trails, uh, the most of which I established. And as uh, Serena said, I'm a member of the Audubon Society, the Cavity Nesters Recovery Program, and the North American Bluebird Society. In uh, 2012, I received an award from NABS uh, for outstanding contribution to bluebird uh, conservation. I work with the Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley uh, to re-nest or to wild foster uh, or release rescued birds. And I'll be talking that, about that in, in part two. That should have been a shocking uh, statement here to make that I am not a birder. I raise birds for birders to watch. Some people can't believe that I'm a birder, but that's the way it is. Uh, I have no formal education. I found out I was a citizen scientist some years ago. And I, in no way do I, I claim that I'm an expert but I do have 19 years of monitoring experience. So if we step back and look at this one particular item here, what, it, what is a cavity nester and what is a recovery program? This is a fantastic graphic that shows where birds nest. And uh, the birds that we're gonna be dealing with are the cavity nesters. So these are some images of natural cavities. So up here we have uh, a dark-eyed jonquil in a, a cavity. All right, here we have a, a barn owl in a cavity. Over here we have a, a northern flicker cavity. Here's a white-breasted nuthatch cavity. And oh, looky here, we have a house wren nest. And if you look real closely, you see uh, the skin of a gopher snake. So a gopher snake got in there and probably uh, consumed the bird that was nesting. So the Cavity Nesters Recovery Program uh, was one of numerous programs that were established because of the uh, decline in, in bluebird populations. And for various reasons, uh, introductions of uh, non-native species, loss of open space, uh, housing developments, the trees are being cut down, etc. So these, these smart people started putting up nest boxes, which is really an artificial cavity. The Cavity Nesters Recovery Program has many volunteers in California who establish and monitor the trails uh, for the cavity nesting birds. And since its foundation in 1995, it's fledged over 350,000 birds. So these are examples of artificial cavities. On the left is the various type of nest boxes that I build. And on the right is those same nest boxes, except they're open. So I like to have easy access to uh, the interior of the nest box. On the left here is an example of one of my hanging nest boxes and the retriever that I use to take it down and put it up. 
Over here is an example of, of three hanging nest boxes in use. One of the advantages of having, uh, having hanging nest boxes is they're very portable. In the situation on the right, I had one box with Western bluebirds. I had another box with tree swallows and another pair of tree swallows were trying to get into uh, the existing boxes. So I hung a third box and they used the third box. So tree swallows, you could probably put boxes back to back and they would be content. They don't, they, they're not uh, uh, aggressive about their territory. Whereas bluebirds, uh, you, you need some distance between the boxes. So this uh, on the left here is again, is a picture of my box and it's a side opening bottom hinge box. So I can open it all the way. This door swings all the way down uh, on the left, it's a hanging box, and on the right, it's a mounted box. So on the right here, you can see the door is all the way open. I have very easy access for clean out. Uh, on the inside here is a little ladder to help the swallows, which have very weak feet, help them uh, fledge out of the box. Uh, if the, because of the way the door is mounted, uh, if I suspect that uh, nestlings are near fledging age, for example, I can put my thumb through the entrance hole and just crack the box open and peek in. And if the situation doesn't bear it opening, then I can close it again. Uh, I can also uh, stick a camera in. Later on, we'll see pictures that I've actually taken inside the box. A small digital camera can fit right up on top here and, and shoot down into the box. So how many boxes do I have? In 2012, I started with 12 boxes. And I kind of peaked out in 2016 with uh, uh, over 500 and, and now I scaled back a little bit. I'm down to uh, about 475. And I also hold the Guinness record for the number, the most uh, hanging nest boxes that you can put on a golf cart, which is 25. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, give you a little background on, on some of these species we're going to be talking about. On the left here is the, the name of the species, the 12 species that I've had in these small and standard nest boxes. And the next column is kind of uh, important because in the graphs that we're going to see, I, I use what's called an alpha code. So everybody, instead of writing out Western Bluebird, can simply put down W-E-B-L and it's a simple code. You can see in this case, it's just the first two letters of each word. So I'll be using alpha codes later on. And since nothing is simple, uh, this is a four character alpha code, although there's variations of four character alpha codes. And there's also a five character alpha code. But what this chart uh, shows you is that, for example, for the Western Bluebird, they can have the one to three broods and typically the, those that are going to have three broods would be down in uh, Southern California, for example. They can have two to eight eggs with five eggs being normal. Uh, the female lays one egg a day until she completes her clutch. Incubation period is uh, 12 to 17 days. And uh, the nesting period, the time the hatchlings and nestlings are in the box varies from 18 to 25 days. So, this detail isn't important at the moment, but we'll get into more of that later. So one, another important thing is to realize that birds do not nest all year round. The, these particular species of birds don't nest all year round. And what this chart shows is uh, my 2020 uh, passerine uh, breeding cycle. So if we look on the, on the bottom here, we see dates. So way back here, uh, the nesting season started on March 11th and these solid colors, solid colors indicate uh, when I have eggs by species. So the dark green here is, is uh, oak titmouse eggs. And when it turns into a hash green, that's when they had nestlings. So if we look at the Western Bluebird, we see Western Bluebird eggs here. And notice how long it goes versus the, the oak titmouse. The oak titmouse has only a single clutch, whereas the Western Bluebird can have two clutches. These would be the Western Bluebird eggs, and these would be the Western Bluebird nestlings. So if we look at tree swallows, again, a long cycle. 
because they have two clutches. And the nesting season actually ended out way out here, I believe it was August 1st, uh, when some bluebirds finally left my nest boxes. So important here, as you can see, the various species that start the nesting season, other species come in. Uh, the ash sort of flycatcher and the violet green swallows come in later. But the season, when did I have the most eggs and, nest, and uh, nestlings in the nest boxes was the second half, uh, mid-May, mid second half of May. And this may shift left or right depending upon the weather. Here is a, a graph that shows for all of the, all of the years since 2002, uh, the species that I've had. And over here, the, the yellow, this is a species Astrid flycatcher. And the yellow bar indicates the number of broods that I've had in my nest boxes. So I've had 200 broods. The red is number of eggs. 827 eggs, how many hatched? 711, how many fledged? 615. And here's the total number of eggs, total number of hatched, total number of fledged. Uh, if we look at which species have I had the most of, well, it's the Western Bluebird. That's been my target species uh, ever since I started. So over the years, I've had 1900 broods and I've fledged 6,151 Western Bluebirds. The red dot is, is kind of interesting because that gives you an idea overall uh, success. If you're a Bluebird egg, what are your chances that you're gonna fledge from the box? For Bluebirds in my boxes, you have about a 70% chance. So the gap between the green bar here and the blue bar is nestlings that didn't hatch up here the difference between the blue bar and the red bar is eggs that didn't hatch for whatever reason. So the least successful species, if we look at it, uh, down here is actually the tree swallows. You can see a big gap here uh, between the number that fledged and the number that hatched. So anyway, we'll, we'll continue. Here's my first video. I hope it comes across well. But what it's showing is a, a hatching tree swallow. Pretty determined little feller coming out of the egg. And if you look right here, you will see a puncture mark. So this egg will uh, so shortly be broken and the, uh, the hatchling exit from the egg. How small are the eggs? This compares a tree swallow egg to a dime. So these are awfully small eggs. Now we get into the various species. This is the Western Bluebird pair. The female is on the left, the male is on the right. Oh, and I want to credit uh, Tom Gray. Uh, some of these photos are uh, from Tom Gray and I appreciate them very much. So again, the Western Bluebird can have one to three broods. Uh, Southern California can experience three bloods where I've not had one yet. Two to, two to eight eggs of, uh, with five being common. Uh, the female lays one egg a day until she completes her brood. The incubation period 12 to 17 days, nesting 18 to 25 days. And Lee, I, we have a couple of questions if you don't mind me jumping in. Sure, go ahead. So the first one is from Anne, who wants to know, how do you avoid squirrels? Uh, I've only had problems with squirrels one time, and that was when I assumed a trail that had a redwood nest box in it, a box made out of redwood, very soft. And when I first found the box, the squirrels had actually chewed the entrance hole and uh, made it so large that they could get into the box. So the first thing I did is I put a portal with the inch and a half entrance hole over the old entrance hole. Uh, the bluebirds uh, built a nest, laid eggs. The eggs hatched, I came back and the squirrel had chewed it out again. So if you don't want anything making the hole larger, what you can do is make a piece of acrylic, put a piece of acrylic over the, the front of the hole and uh, that would restrict uh, woodpeckers, for example, from making the hole larger than an inch and a half. It might have to be pretty thick to keep squirrels out, 
but if you have a real problem with squirrels, I would move the box. Again, I've only had problems with the squirrels one, one time. I, mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And then Margo wanted to know what kind of camera do you use in the nest boxes? Uh, these folders are just with a cheap, small, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the brand name even. I can't even think of the name. Nikon, for example, uh, they have cameras, uh, digital cameras in the $100 range. Uh, very small, very thin. And I just place it into the box uh, near the top, shooting down. This, box, this photo wasn't quite shot down, but I, what, what I'm doing is showing the, the seven eggs in it. Okay, great. So like a digital camera. Yeah, a small digital camera, yes. And I shoot video or, or pictures. Yes. So you can, oh, I'm go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to go on to the next question. Sure. Um, Laura wants to know what you do with the infertile or unhatched eggs. Uh, usually I, I leave them right in there and, and they seem to disappear for whatever reason. Uh, if, if the entire clutch of eggs is abandoned, uh, in that case, I will remove them. Okay. And there have been instances where I have taken eggs out of the box because they were infertile, but I don't always do that. Hmm. So what's interesting about this nest here is, is a typical Western bluebird nest made out of grass with a finer grass in the cup here. Uh, sometimes they will bring feathers into the box and sometimes uh, pieces of cellophane, pieces of paper. So I think with the, the latter two items, they're actually uh, treating them as, as if it was a feather. Some of these nests, you really can't tell what species it is until the nest becomes more complete. For example, a tree swallow nest starts out similarly, but once they start bringing in a whole bunch of feathers, then you know it's a tree swallow nest. So here we have seven uh, bluebird eggs, which is, which happens, but it's not that common versus four or five eggs or, or even six eggs. The, the downside of, of uh, having seven eggs is that probably not all hatchlings uh, will fledge. Here we have on the right, uh, we have eggs that have just hatched. You can see an, a part of an eggshell that hasn't been removed yet and the adult will remove it. So on day zero, the, the hatchling is the same size as the egg. Here we have a female Western bluebird with uh, nestlings that are a few days old. And notice how carefully she's stepping between the nestlings. A beautiful bird. Here we have another uh, female uh, Western bluebird incubating eggs. And notice in this case that the nest is made out of pine needles. Even though the nest is made out of pine needles, the base of the nest here, it'll still be finished with a finer material uh, in the cup of the nest. Here I was able to catch some uh, nestlings shortly or some hatchlings shortly after they hatched and they're able to get their head up. If they can't get their head up, they're not going to be fed. Sometimes I look into a nest box and I see a pile of nestlings, uh, hatchlings, and one hatchling is way on the bottom. And uh, I immediately hope that he will eventually be able to work his head up and, and be fed. I don't intervene in situations like that. The, these are awfully fragile little hatchlings. So on day 7 to 11, the eyes begin to open, but there's still slits. If you look here, you can see the uh, Western Bluebird, the just the small slits in the eyes, so he's probably around uh, eight, nine days old. And you can see the, the uh, feathers protruding from the wings. Uh, the bodies are becoming more and more covered with feathers. So here we have uh, Western Bluebirds that are about uh, two weeks old. You can see their tail feathers are coming out. Uh, the blue wing feathers are. And on the right we have uh, nestlings that are actually 21 days old. You can see the various obvious eye ring and the white uh, spots on the back. And uh, uh, the eye ring becomes uh, apparent around day 16. So the very next day, these nestlings were gone. 
And when you look at the box here, you can see blueberry or stains on the box, a purple color. And what that means is that uh, typically in, in second clutch bluebirds, we have uh, several sources of elderberries. Uh, some of my trails have elderberries growing on them and the birds will actually, uh, when there's a shortage of insects, start uh, feeding elderberries to the, to the nestlings. So we just saw uh, blue western bluebird eggs. And typically, they, yes, they are blue, but in some cases, I've had cases where uh, the eggs are white. And what that means is that the female has a genetic defect. The gland that is supposed to provide the coloring for the egg isn't working, and the eggs come out white. Now, I had an interesting experience in one of my trails on a golf club. Uh, for this, in the very same nest box for seven years, I had a female lay white eggs, seven consecutive years. She laid a total of 11 clutches, 51 eggs, but near the end of those seven years in 2017, the second clutch were abandoned for whatever reason. In 2018, the first clutch was abandoned. And by abandoned, I mean the eggs uh, were not being incubated. And in 2019, the first clutch of nestlings disappeared. Uh, second clutch eggs were not viable and they didn't hatch. So that poor little female sat on those eggs about 30 days before she abandoned them. She was trying to, to hatch them. And seven years might indicate that this is the life of the, the female. So here I have a photo of uh, another nest box with two white eggs. These two eggs did not hatch, but the, the nestlings were perfectly normal. They, they grew up normally and they fledged. So moving on to the chestnut back chickadee, one to two broods, uh, one to 11 eggs, uh, with six or seven being normal. Female lays one egg a day, uh, 12 to 18 days incubation, nesting period 18 to 21 days. So here we have a typical uh, chestnut back chickadee nest. And it used to be when I saw the, the nest being started and I saw moss, I, I was pretty certain that it was going to be a chestnut back chickadee nest. In this case here, you can see some moss uh, around the nest. We also have uh, stripped redwood bark and uh, the nest is lined with uh, fur. So they build a really, really nice uh, soft warm nest. And one reason they might do that is chickadees kick off the nesting season in March when it's still, the weather can still be rather inclement. Here we have uh, a chestnut back chickadee, a uh, view from a little farther out. We can see moss in the nest here. We can see all the fur and hair that the female has brought in. And here we have hatchlings with still one, one unhatched egg. Here they're a little older, maybe five, uh, six days old. You can see their feathers are coming out. They actually cause the, the cup of the nest to expand because they're getting bigger as time goes by. And here we have the, the nest as I originally described, if I saw moss, uh, I knew it was gonna turn out to be a chickadee box. So this is actually a chickadee nest in a Western bluebird box, which is a five inch by five inch floor. Whereas a chickadee box, typically I would have a four inch by four inch floor. So when the nest was being built, this looked like it was actually uh, the old green shag carpet that some of you people may remember. So these chickadees, uh, I mean, they are so cute. And uh, one caution is that when they get near the fledging age, they really get jumpy. So I'm, I'm rather careful when I open, open the box. Lee, a uh, quick question from Karen. Where do they get the fur? Well, we used to have dogs and we would comb the dogs and we'd go to the park and we'd actually draw, drop off the, whatever we combed off the dog. And other people do that too. Uh, one of the parks uh, has a lot of people walking their dogs and, and somehow magically they, they find it. For a while, I, I had actually gone to, on to a groomer and uh, asked for clippings from, from the dogs. And I would put a little basket on the side of the nest, fill it with, uh, uh, fur and uh, they would actually use that fur. So <laughs> they're, they're really good at finding it. I'm amazed at how much they find. 
So I, I love the oak tip mouse because of its little crest here. And they can have one to two broods, uh, three to nine eggs with seven being normal. Female lays one egg a day, uh, 14 to 16 days incubation, nesting period, uh, 16 to 21 days. And here's a female incubating and bless their little hearts. Uh, I could open up box after box of, after box of tit mice and have the female on the nest and it is really rare for them to flush. So uh, I'm really hesitant to take a picture. Uh, they're looking at me and their little heart is probably racing away. Uh, I peek in in a situation like this and I would close the box up, see you next week. I never make any of my ladies get up off the nest. So here we have a uh, oak tip mouse nest. Notice that we have some grass here. We have some moss uh, blending in it. And here's the, the cup of the nest finished with hair and fur. Um, let me see what else they might have in here. They may also bring in shuttered bark, a wool, uh, twigs, plant fibers, rope, string, uh, etc. So here I have two, four, six, eight, nine eggs. Uh, the most I've ever had in a box is 10 eggs. But again, when you get into these large clutch sizes, uh, the likelihood of all of the nestlings fledging uh, decreases the more eggs they have. So here they're hatched, they have a, a couple of days old. Or on the left here, um, one interesting thing about this nest here is you look at the color of the nestlings and you look at the color of everything else in here and is that intentional? Uh, are they trying to camouflage the nestlings? So these uh, I would guess are, are five, six days old. On the right here, I have one of my nest boxes and it's wall-to-wall oak tip mouse nestlings. So they, they don't get particularly jumpy. So I, I felt uh, safe opening the box here and uh, grabbing this picture. But now that I have the picture, I have less reason to open the box and take a picture. This is an interesting bird, the white uh, breasted nuthatch. And no, the photo isn't upside down. The bird actually can creep up and down uh, tree trunks. Uh, has one brood, five to nine eggs, with eight being typical. Female lays one egg a day. Incubation period, 13 to 14 days. Uh, nesting period, 26, which is rather long for these uh, kind of birds. Towards the end, you know, I'm, I'm wishing, will you, will, you, will you please leave the box? And this is an interesting photo. Uh, my early experience, this is a photo from my early experience with a, a white-breasted nuthatch. And when I took the box down, I saw these scribblings on the top of the box. And what I thought it was, what I was hoping it was, is the bird was trying to communicate with me. And it turns out what the nuthatches do is they take um, blister beetles. They catch blister beetles and then they squash them and make these lines on the box. Not only on the top of the box, but around the entrance hole too. Now the blister beetle is appropriately named because you can have a reaction, we can have a reaction uh, on our skin. But uh, for, for example, squirrels, uh, people think that it's the reason for it is it's supposed to deter squirrels. Uh, they would get a reaction also from uh, getting the, the, the juice, the blister beetle juice on, on their skin. Unfortunately, they, they weren't trying to communicate with me. So here's a typical uh, white-breasted nuthatch. It used to be when I saw bark in the bottom of the box and twigs and then later on grass and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I knew it was a white-breasted nuthatch. So they bring uh, fur, bark, and lumps of dirt into the box. It, it looks rather gross, but uh, that's what they do. Here we have a large clutch of Western Bluebird, I'm sorry, a white-breasted nuthatch eggs. Here we have uh, white-breasted, um, yes. Yeah, we have a question. It with the beetles, are, are nuthatches squeezing out some toxin before feeding them to the young? 
No, no, uh, the beetle, uh, I'm sorry, the blister beetles are actually squashing them and rubbing them on the nest box and they're not feeding them to any nestlings because at that time they don't have any nestlings. And what it is, it's thought to be a deterrent for predators like squirrels, for example. Um, and Lois wants to know, um, are red-breasted at hatch nests pretty much the same as white-breasted? I have not been uh, lucky to get red-breasted nuthatches. Uh, my wife, Jana, who is a birder, <laughs> saw a red-breasted nuthatch in the local city park, and I scurried over there and put up another nest box, but I've not had that luck. So I, I can't really answer that question. There is a, a website called Sialia, and uh, if you go to Sialia, uh, I forget if it's .org, uh, they have lots and lots of pictures of different kinds of nest boxes, but I've, I've never looked, I'm sorry, lot, lots and lots of pictures of nests. I've not looked what uh, kind of a nest a red-breasted does. I suspect that it would be pretty similar. Okay, uh, we'll move on. And here I have uh, uh, a white-breasted nut hatch nestling and it has its neck up. These muscles here are probably stronger than anything that Arnold Schwarzenegger ever had because it has to get its head up if it's going to be fed. Here they are a little bit older, uh, maybe around a week. They're filling the cup of the nest and here they are uh, approaching a fledging age. They really get jumpy so I'm very very careful I, I may just crack, put my thumb in the entrance hole of the box, crack the box open and uh, peek in. Now, one reason I would peek in is uh, if, if they're to see whether or not there's a problem in the box. I, yes, I want to get a beak count, but what I don't want to see in the box is I don't want to see a dead nestling because depending on the time of the year, the nestling can really turn to swoop uh, quickly and you can have maggots crawling in the box, etc. So one of the reasons we, we monitor the boxes is to, uh, to aid the nestlings uh, whenever we can, aid the birds whenever we can. So here we have the tree swallow and they can have one or two broods. I, I, many of my uh, tree swallows have second clutches, four to seven eggs with five being normal. Uh, female lays one egg a day incubation period, uh, 11 to 20 days. That's a, a pretty broad range here. And uh, again, here's another broad range of, of the nesting period, time before they fledge up to 25 days. Here we have a uh, typical tree swallow nest. It may look like a bluebird nest when it starts because they start at the, the base of the nest with, with uh, grass stems, but then they line the cup of the nest with feathers. And the more feathers they find, the more successful they're going to be because the nestling or the, the birds can actually hide down in the nest. And sometimes when I, I'm checking a box, uh, the nest has been built. I don't know if there's any eggs in the box or not. So I stick my finger in and, and carefully part the feathers. What I might see is an eyeball looking back at me. So the female is in there, she stays right down in the feathers, uh, doesn't exit the box. As soon as I see the eye, I close the box up, I'll, I'll come back, I'll see you next week. So on the right here, we have a, a nest with more feathers and uh, some uh, young, just a few days old hatchlings. The downside of bringing these feathers into the box is the, the feathers may contain feather mites. So I've had cases where uh, I took a nest box down. My first experience with feather mites, I took a box down and the sleeve of my shirt touched the top of the box and I started feeling things crawl on my arm. I had to put on my reading glasses and I saw a whole bunch of black things crawling all over my sleeve. So those are, those are feather mites and they can literally almost seemingly cover uh, nestlings and what I read is it doesn't cause any harm to the nestlings, but it's got to be very aggravating. So in that situation, when you, when you have uh, feather mites, what you can do is you can take a product called 
uh, DE, uh, food grade DE, diet to make you serve, food grade, that's the important part of it. And you can buy a little puffer, you fill the puffer with uh, the food grade DE, and then uh, sometimes I shoot it, stick the nozzle right in the nest. Very easy for me to do because I have a side opening box. Stick it in the nest a couple of places, puff it. You can actually uh, shoot it right onto the nestlings and, and it, it won't hurt them. So I, I do more than a nest, maybe the, the walls of the nest box, depending on how many feather mites they are. I had a friend who had a, a bad outbreak and he said he actually took a paper bag, put some DE in it, put the nestlings in the bag and carefully shook it, a shake and bake type experience uh, to get the powder on, onto the nestlings and put them back in the box again. So you can also be a little proactive and as the uh, nest, you see the nest is complete yet no eggs have been laid or even if eggs have been laid, uh, shoot some DE into the nest and uh, hopefully you will avoid getting uh, feather mites at all. So on the left here we have uh, uh, some tree swallow nestlings but one bird I want to point out here is if you look at the size of this bird here, this uh, nestling compared to this nestling, this one is much bigger and the reason my first thought was, well, he's not getting enough food, but they also, there's a possibility of a synchronous hatching, which means this bird, this nestling hatched after these other nestlings. And the reason for that would be the female starts incubating her eggs before her entire clutch is complete. I love this photo here because these are uh, tree swallow nestlings and they're all backed into the corner wanting to get away from me. So here we have the violet green swallow. Uh, this is a um, one of the, both swallows are migratory, but these birds even fly down to Mexico or Costa Rica and uh, come back late, uh, later in the season to begin nesting. They can have, they do have one brood, uh, four to six eggs. Uh, female lays one egg a day, 13 to 14 days incubation, 20 to 21 days uh, before they fledge. So here we have a, a violet green swallow nest and I cannot tell the difference between a violet green swallow nest and a tree swallow nest. I have to wait until I can actually see the adult or see the nestlings when they're further developed. So on the left here, I have a, a egg that uh, has just hatched. Over here, they're a couple of days old probably. And here we have uh, older violet green swallows and nesting. But again, notice the runt over here. He's much smaller than these other nestlings. Now, sometimes the runt, runt actually survives, but uh, I fear too often that it, it uh, doesn't survive. Uh, tree swallows, uh, especially, uh, you can have one of the nestlings uh, called a um, hole hoarder. He gets in the entrance hall, he perches in the entrance hall uh, with all the other nestlings in the boxes and when the adults bring food, he gets fed. So he's the strongest, probably the most dominant, and he gets all the food. Whereas uh, since he's in, in the entrance hole, the adults can't fly in and make, make sure that everybody's fed. Here we have uh, older violet green swallow nestings, and they're at the age where I can actually tell that it's violet green swallows because they have white eyebrows which the uh, tree swallow nestlings do not have. Here we have the Buick's wren, uh, one to two broods, three to 10 eggs, six to seven normal, one egg a day, nine to 16 days incubation period, uh, 15 to 17 days uh, before they fledge, kind of a short schedule there. I'm sorry, that was a house wren in case I said that was a Buick's wren, it was actually a house wren. So here we have a, an almost typical house wren nest. What the male does is he, he will fill several cavities, nearby cavities with twigs. Uh, some cases all the way up to the top of the nest box with a tunnel that goes from the entrance hole into the box. So the male will build several, uh, fill several cavities with tw twigs and the female then decides which of the cavities she likes and then she finishes the cup of the nest. So over here, you can see how she's uh, filled the uh, cup of the nest. 
with uh, various materials. And uh, these, this is the hardest nest to take photos of because sometimes it's impossible. This particular nest here, I didn't go to the top of the box. So I was able to get uh, a camera into the box and get a photo. Here's the nestlings as they grow. And, and here they are, they're approaching fledging age. At this age, uh, some have already fledged and uh, they're really jumpy at that age. You can see some more down in, in the uh, cup of the nest here. The downside of the house wren is I already mentioned that they fill several cavities. So those cavities may be unusable to other birds depending on how many twigs they have in it. Besides other birds really shouldn't nest near where house wrens are because the male has a horrible habit. He will run around and he will peck holes into the eggs of the species that are nesting nearby. And even though these other three eggs in this case here may not have a puncture hole, uh, all of the eggs will be abandoned. The female will, will abandon all of the eggs. It's not only problems with eggs, but the, the, house, the male house wren will actually drag the nestlings out of the box too. Here's the Buick strand, and uh, she has a little beauty. Uh, one to three broods, three to eight eggs, frequency one, um, one a day, 14 to 16 day incubation period, and again, a short uh, nesting period. This is the most impressive nest that, that I've seen because it's of all the various materials that went into it. Uh, the base of the nest is made out of sticks and grasses and rootlets and leaves and moss and other plant uh, materials, uh, sometimes even spider egg cases. <clears throat> the cup of the nest may be lined with uh, feathers, wool, hair, plant, uh, down, uh, even snake skins. So if you look at the length of this twig here, uh, I really wonder if she had a saw with her or if she was able to bite off the end and fit it in the box. But it's a beautiful nest because of all of the different materials that are used. Uh, I love to, to get Buick's friends, but I don't always get them. Now in this case over here, uh, that doesn't look like a Buick's nest uh, on the bottom, but in, indeed it was a Buick's nest. Uh, this may have been a case of the Buick's uh, wren uh, usurping the uh, swallow that was building the nest or the uh, uh, western bluebird. Could have been an oak titmouse too. So she's, she's really jumpy and I took a chance to get this shot here just so I finally had a picture of a female on the nest. But here she is hunkered down in the nest. Uh, again, a beautiful nest. You can see here she's using catkins as nesting material. And even the eggs are beautiful. So this is a shot of the eggs here. And what makes the eggs so spectacular is they will have a band of red dots around it, just like the Milky Way galaxy. So here the, the eggs have hatched and uh, the nestlings, I'm, I'm guessing five, six days old. And now we're moving on to house finches. So house finches are kind of interesting because look at how many broods they can have. They can have up to six broods. Two to six eggs lays one a day, uh, 13 to 14 days incubation, nesting period 12 to 19 days. Uh, Wow, one to six broods. So the first time I encountered uh, uh, house finches was uh, I had a box at Cinnabar Hills Golf Club where I had a bluebird nest box mounted below a barn owl box on a post. And I had put a predator guard on the front here. And lo and behold, the house finch builds a nest in the predator guard instead of going inside the box. So. House finches are the kind of birds that if you have a broken light fixture outside, they, they might build a nest in it. They're building nests anywhere. So here's the, the nest later on when the eggs are being laid. Here we have uh, uh, nestlings. And notice what they're doing with their excrement. They're putting their excrement, uh, fortifying their nest. So here we have the uh, house finch uh, nestlings. And they're still out in the open here. I actually put a cover over the, um, over the predator guard to protect them from the sun. And I had them just for three years for some, I'm sorry, so for four years. 
So in 2013, all of a sudden, I had house finches building uh, nests, not only in this predator guard, but in barn owl boxes and in kestrel boxes. And the reason they were doing that is they appear to like light, lots of light. So for these years, I had uh, initially in 2013, I had lots of house finches and then it tapered off to, I think in 2017, I only had one. Now, I wondered why did I have house finches all of a sudden? Well, there was a house finch disease that broke out on the East Coast in, in 1924 at some pet store. And gradually over the years, it worked its way west. And this map here shows it was on the West Coast in, in 2019. My wife, Jana, the birder, would uh, look through her binoculars at house finches in the backyard and their eyes are all swollen shut. They had the house finch disease. So what people were supposed to do is keep their feeders clean and maybe even pull them in uh, to prevent the spread of the disease. But uh, here we have 2019, supposedly they hit on the West Coast where in 2013 is when I first experienced them. So I haven't had uh, house finches for a couple of years now. now. This is the Ashford flycatcher and this photo is just outstanding. It was taken by a photographer called, uh, named Claudia Peterson. And I would occasionally see her on one of my trails. She and her husband would be there. Uh, she would ask me what anything interesting and I pointed out the fact that I had Ashford flycatchers in a box up on the hill. So for three days, she spent uh, set on the side of a hill, set up with a tripod or camera, taking many photos. And she finally uh, captured this photo here. She said the bird landed and it turned its beak uh, with the dragonfly in it. And she actually won an award for that photo. And be so, uh, really quickly, sorry, before you continue with the Ashford flycatcher, Margo wanted to know if purple finch nests are similar to house finches. Uh, again, I have no experience with uh, purple finch. I, <laughs> I wish I did, but I'm sorry I can't answer that uh, question. So um, the Ashford flycatcher, one, uh, one brood, two to seven eggs, four or five eggs, that's pretty common. Uh, frequency, that's interesting. A, a passerine that lays eggs on a one or two day schedule incubation period 14 to 16 days and here we have uh, 13 to 17 days uh, before they fledge. Now this is kind of a low for, for a bird that size. So here we have a, a typical astro flycatcher nest and what they do build a nest out of is twigs and rootless uh, grass, pieces of cow manure, strips of bark. It, it really looks rather foul on the inside. But you can see how it, it's, it's grass here and grass rootless for the base, and then all these other materials on the top, including uh, cow dung. And here they are, striped eggs. Here they've uh, lined the cup of the nest with uh, a whole bunch of fur. Here they've hatched, and again, this is another case where look at the, the color of the hatchlings, the nestlings. And, and the background as if it's intentional so that they blend into the nest. Here we have a, a nest box full of Ashford flycatchers. Uh, they are, Ashford flycatcher is my favorite bird. It's, it's also the most offensive. The female is the most offensive of all of the birds that I, uh, passerines that I work with. And by defensive, what I mean is uh, if I visit a box and I hear from the inside of the box a clacking sound. She's in the box and she's clacking her beak together, warning me to stay away. So I just simply turn on my heel and I'll, I'll see you next week. I don't open the box up. This is the uh, nut owl woodpecker. And on the left is a female, on the right is a male. And uh, one brood, three to six eggs, lays one egg a day, incubation 14. Nesting period, uh, 29 days. Now the nut owl woodpecker is, is rather interesting because they don't normally <clears throat> nest in a nest box. Yes, they nest in natural cavities, but not in nest boxes. So in seven of 19 seasons, I've found a total of 19 broods. And by a brood, I mean a collection of eggs, one or more eggs, totaling 46 eggs. Over those years, this one egg hatched and one nestling fledged. First time I found nut all wood uh, pecker eggs in a box, I believe the clutch size was about four eggs. 
uh, wow, I went back and read up on not all woodpeckers, and yes, it looks like not all woodpeckers, because they can fit through the uh, one and a half inch entrance hole. Uh, the next week I came back, all the eggs were gone. The next week I came back, I think there were three eggs. Next week I came back, there were no eggs. So, uh, gee, is that predation? That's why I've had 19 broods, because the eggs keep disappearing. But in the one year, uh, one of the eggs uh, hatched, and I actually had a not all woodpecker nestlings. Look, this is a, a redwood nest box, and if you look at all of the chips, the adults made all these chips from the interior of the nest box. So we have one infertile egg here, and there's a nestling uh, as he's getting older. I went to a convention down in Los Angeles and there was a, an author down there, Stefan Schunk, who had heard that I had uh, uh, not all woodpeckers in a nest box and he was wanting to see my photos. So using my cell phone, I linked to my website and showed him the photos and he was salivating because he was excited about this. And he said, the wood, I told him what had happened in the box and he said the woodpeckers moved the eggs around. So I've looked for documentation on that fact, but I've not found it. I wish now that I would have asked Steve uh, more questions about them moving their eggs around. So knowing all this, everything about nests now, you know, look at this nest here and what do you think it is? It's the first time I've ever seen a nest like that. And what it turns out to be is a chestnut back chickadee nest. So this is an example of all of the different kinds of nests that I've seen the chickadee, chestnut pack chickadees build. So depending upon the material that's available, they will use different kinds of materials for the base of the nest, but they always finish the nest in the same way. It's kind of like humans in North Dakota, they didn't have any trees to cut down, so they made the sod houses. What don't I want to see in a nest box? I don't want to see house sparrows. So house sparrows, uh, there's a male on the left, a female on the right, and uh, they can have one to four broods, one to eight eggs, uh, incubation 10 to 14 days, and a nesting period of only 14 days. So if they have four broods, 80, eight eggs, I'm sorry, four broods, eight eggs each, uh, that's a bunch of uh, uh, house sparrows that they can fledge. This is a, a typical house sparrow nest made out of uh, grass and leaves and whatever. They, they bring the trash in, into the nest, but what they do is they will have a tunnel through the entrance hole down into the nest. This is not a box that I made, that's why it, it looks that way. But it is typical of a, uh, in, of a house sparrow nest. In my case, with my side opening box, I would open up the side of the box and I would see the side of the nest and I would stick my pinky in and feel down into the nest. So these are house sparrow eggs. I have never fledged a house sparrow. Ideally, what I like to do is, is uh, let the female lay her eggs and then I will remove all of the eggs. And the reason I'm doing that is because it is a non-native uh, species. The house sparrow was introduced into the United States uh, in 1851 in Brooklyn where they were having problems with a, a linden moth. So they brought house sparrows in and yes, they got rid of the moth larvae, but the uh, house sparrows propagated the, uh, spreading across North America, uh, killing native nest birds, etc. cetera. Um, there's over 540 million uh, house sparrows now. So the, the male will come into a nest, puncture the eggs, and if they want that particular box, they will kill anything that's in the box, including adults, uh, nestlings, whatever. And I've actually experienced them killing all of the nestlings in a box, and they were building a nest on top of the dead nestlings. So you can be either proactive about house sparrows, or you could be reactive. <laughs> there's, there's a technique to, some people say, if you tip the box, give it a slope, kind of like a Peterson nest box, <coughs> It makes it more resistance to house, house sparrows. Excuse me. <clears throat> there's also a <clears throat> there's also a suggestion to make to make the box a swinging swinging box. 
If the box swings, they can't land on it. <clears throat> or you can be reactive like I am trying to um, remove all of the eggs after they, the female has completed a clutch of eggs. <clears throat> I also get mice uh, and rats into the nest box. This little one that fell down here was so cute. I, I didn't disturb her, but these others I did get out of the box. Here's an example of what they can do in a box. This was a tree swallow nest with eggs and the mice come into the box, they burrow down, they destroy eggs, they kill nestlings. And <clears throat> typically they will uh, nest in the bottom of the box. Uh, yellow jackets can be a problem. Uh, here is a case of a gopher snake got into a bluebird nest box. Uh, <clears throat> this was during the drought period, so I, I'm thinking that the snake, snake was really, really hungry <clears throat> and he heard uh, birds chirping from a nest box hanging in a tree. <clears throat> it climbed up the uh, uh, coast live oak trunk across the branch and dropped down, down into the box and the four nestlings that should have been in the box weren't in the box. Here's a case where a paper wasp came in and built a nest inside a nest box. This is not one of my boxes, by the way. Another problem I have is acorn woodpeckers. Uh, they store the acorns in the box as a granary. So in the springtime and a couple of trails, I, I <clears throat> find boxes that are literally full of acorns. I dump the acorns on the ground, come back the next week. There may be some more acorns in the, in the box. And uh, then I uh, dump those acorns out in the third week, they probably won't make anything. So I had another section uh, that I was hoping to get to, but uh, I see I'm out of time. Yeah, what I'm trying to address in, in this section here is why are we having losses? On some one of the earlier graphs, I talked about the gap between number of eggs laid, number hatched, and, and number fledged. What are the causes of, of that? So if, if um, people want to hang in later, I'm, I mean, I'm willing to go on. Yeah, that sounds good. So how about let's get the, to the questions that came in first, and then we can continue with this section. Okay. So um, regarding photos, Becky had asked, do you take the photos remotely? Uh, no, I no, I don't. Not with, not with the passerines. I'm, I'm opening the boxes up and with my little pinkies sticking a digital camera into the box. Okay, so I think so it's, it's very easy to do because it's a most of my boxes are hanging boxes. I can take them down, put them on the ground or, or something else if I have to, to take a photo. Okay, thanks. And I think that then answers Linda, Linda's question who asked how you control when to turn on and off the camera and when it uh, when to take the photo. So you're just doing it manually, right? Yeah, you can see I did have a couple of videos and all of the videos were rather short because I'm an intruder in the nest box. Uh, in one case, I, I showed a video of uh, an egg hatching, for example. Uh, I, I just spent enough time in it to get the, the hatching and then I was out of the box. Uh, as far as monitoring, you, you don't want to uh, visit the box too often. I think Nest Watch recommends every three or four days, but in fact, I go every week. If you did it on a daily basis, you would probably cause the adults to abandon the, the box. Then, so I try, uh, I try to be as less intrusive as possible. And Renee asked, are there specific nest box hanging height requirements for each species? Well, if you looked online, yes, you would uh, get uh, ranges of distances, but with bluebirds, uh, what I read, the ideal height is uh, five feet. Now, one of my trails is in an old orchard and cows graze in the old orchard. So my only concern, I would like to put the boxes at five feet, uh, but in that particular trail, I have to keep them high enough so the cows can't bump them. Uh, sometimes I mount them on fence posts along a fence line and they're probably, uh, I mean, I can walk up to the box, it's right there and I open it. Uh, other boxes where I'm in city parks, for example, there could be cases of vandalism. Uh, in, in some cases, I, I hang them about 20 feet high just to keep them away from uh, ne'er-do-wells. Um, and then Linda 
asks, do you clean out the boxes at the end of the nesting season? And Beverly said both beginning and the end of the nesting season. In, um, uh, in February, I'll do a preseason check of the boxes. So when I'm doing a preseason checking, what I'm looking for is whether or not the box is mechanically sound. It does the door open, is the door there, etc. In some cases, even is the box there because I've had some boxes disappear. So I, I do a preseason check and what I might find is uh, mice have moved into the box, for example, something else moved into the box, even incomplete nests. Even though I thought the nesting season was over at the uh, early August, some sometimes a female decides she's going to go again and, and she may start building a nest. In some cases, I've actually found, you know, the evidence that the eggs had hatched and there were nestlings. So I, I do a preseason check in the, in the beginning of the spring to make sure the box is cleaned out and uh, ready for the nesting season. Uh, typically starting around February 1st, but you want it to be done by March 1st because the, the smaller, the early nesters start nesting in March. Uh, and then after every uh, clutch has fledged, I usually clean the box out. I don't wait until um, the end of the season. I don't want another uh, nest to be built on top of the old nest. And the reason for that is if you get one bird nest on top of another nest, it makes the, the cup of the nest closer to the entrance hole and more uh, subject to predation. Uh, some of the nests like tree swallows nests are really gross when they fledge. So that's uh, another reason you'd want to clean the nest out. If I have abandoned eggs, the nest is perfectly fine and I have abandoned eggs, what I'll do is I'll leave the nest in the nest box because they may come back and they may lay eggs in that existing nest. If I find out the nest isn't used, what I do is put it in a box and put it in my truck and I use it as replacement nests. I've had occasions where I open up a box and there's a dead bluebird nestling in it. However, there's three or four live nestlings and there's maggots in the box. The nest is really gross. I, I get one of my spare nests, uh, bring it over to the box, move the nestlings, take the, nest, the living nestlings out of the box, put them in a cardboard box, pull out the old nest, put in the new nest, and then put the nestlings back into the box in a clean nest, close it up and, and hang it. And in all those cases, the, the, all of the living nestlings fledged. So uh, to answer your question, uh, clean it out, do a preseason check in the spring, and then I know a lot of a lot of people say clean it out in the fall, but I would suggest you not do that. Clean it out after every time uh, a clutch is fledged from the box. Yeah, I think that answers one of the other questions. And um, E also asked, are the same birds returning each year? Uh, I would say yes. In the case of the seven years, uh, white eggs white uh, bluebird eggs in the same nest box, yes. And uh, my friend Steve Simmons, who was in the banding, would, would uh, say, yes, yes, the birds come back to the same boxes. What I find is even though it's, say for example, it's bluebirds and they're laying blue bay, bluebird eggs, I, I can have the same box uh, used four or five years in a row, and then it may not be used, as if the pair that had been using the box something happened to them and and they moved on. So uh, yes, birds come back to the same box. And in part two, where we talk about the, the raptors, uh, that's also true. And so, sort of related or along the same lines, Diane and Tom asked if the same nests are used for all broods. And Mike mentioned that the nests get trashed and a new nest has to be built for each brood. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, I don't, I th the first part of the question was, do the nests get reused? Uh, I said if, if uh, the eggs were abandoned and uh, uh, the, egg is, the nest is in good shape, I remove the eggs, leave the nest, and they may reuse it again. Uh, and there's also cases of predation, say, for example, I, today I see five bluebird eggs come back next week, there's no eggs. Uh, someone has been in there probably a house wren and he removed all of the eggs. I'll leave the nest in, in the box 
And what I might find is in a week, another week, the female will start laying eggs again. The females can turn their hormones on and off and uh, lay another clutch of eggs. Um, and then Anne wants to know, is this the time of year to start cleaning out bluebird nest boxes? They are still flitting around their boxes. Uh, but they're not nesting. So most people would tell you clean it out at end of season. So uh, end of season for me was about August 1st this year. So uh, your last trip to the nest boxes, uh, uh, you would want them cleaned out. But you may have to do it again in, in the spring when you do a pre-season check of the boxes. Now, some people say, oh, you want to leave the nest in there. You know, it's a nice place to roost. But in, in fact, uh, the nest, because of our rainstorms, uh, you could have rain get in the box. The nest could get wet and moldy. Uh, it could be diseased. Uh, birds that roost in the box could uh, die from the disease. And let's see, um, Margo asks, should the boxes be hung facing a certain direction? <laughs> Uh, most people would tell you face them from east to south, southeast, for example. And the reason for that is they want the nest box to catch the morning rays of sunlight. <clears throat> so the entrance hole is, is uh, more noticeable. Some people actually take black uh, construction paper and cut out uh, small circles and staple these small circles to the sides of nest boxes hoping that a bird in the distance will see this black thing and think it's uh, a cavity. So people actually do things to try to, to make the entrance hole more uh, visible. But uh, south to southeast, uh, I've actually hung boxes. I drop them low in a tree. So the box is evident, for example. And then once it gets nesting activity, I raise the box in the tree. I'm trying to hide it and I'm trying to hide it from uh, uh, house runs, for example. Uh, so you can move a box around in a tree even after it's started. Sometimes I have nesting activity go into my box and something's changed with the tree. Uh, the box is getting more sun exposure than I like. So I might move the box into the shade. Again, one of the advantages of hanging nest boxes is they're very portable. I like to hang a box in a tree on the east side, uh, for example, such that it doesn't get uh, the noontime sun or the hot afternoon sun. We want to keep the temperature in the box uh, as low as we can. Uh, my box also has flow through ventilation. So flow through ventilation helps keep the box uh, cooler. Not all nest boxes have flow through ventilation. Um, and then uh, Irene wants to know where your boxes are located. <laughs> Everywhere. Uh, at one time I thought I, every, every tree should have a nest box, uh, but, but that turns out. I, I live in Almond Valley of area of San Jose, South San Jose. <clears throat> and uh, I'm in several city parks, Guadalupe Oak Grove Park. I don't know if you're familiar with these areas, uh, Greystone Park. Um, uh, a couple of city parks and uh, I'm at IBM Research uh, property and uh, going uh, east from IBM Research, I'm in Santa Teresa County Park, I'm in uh, Santa Teresa Golf Club and going to the south I'm in Cinnabar Hills Golf Club which is my biggest trail over 200 nest boxes. So Cinnabar Hills Golf Club is really an oasis because in, in the dead of summer they have green grass growing and and hopefully insects on the grass. Uh, that is my tree swallow factory. And uh, the other golf course, Santa Teresa Golf Course, a golf club is uh, my bluebird factory. I raise more bluebirds there than any other trail. And uh, uh, IBM Research Center is my barn owl factory, my kestrel factory, uh, because of the habitat that it's in. Um, my small city park, uh, one has my chickadees, I get more chickadees there than elsewhere. And another city park, I get the most violet green swallows that I do anywhere. So each, each trail has a, a different habitat, a different expectations of what you might get there. Uh, and then Robin wants to know if those numbers that you gave for broods and length of time to fledge, etc., is that your data or is that from other sources? 
Uh, it actually came from a monitoring guide uh, that's posted on the uh, Silicon Valley Audubon Society's website. Uh, I forget the name of the author, uh, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful guide. It's, it's only 20 some pages long. And uh, that most of the information I have came from uh, that monitoring guide. The information that I couldn't fill in, I went to Cornell and, and uh, got some statistics from them. Great. And then uh, let's see, Robin, and maybe you'll get to this in this next part. Um, they said that the Solano Land Trust bluebird boxes have a lot of predation. Do you experience much since your boxes are hanging from trees? Well, hanging boxes uh, is, <laughs> is kind of a quandary because uh, Southern California uses hanging bo nest boxes. We use them here on hanging, we use them in, in the Bay Area here. But on the East Coast, they would, uh, they would not want a hanging nest box. They have a different set of problems than we do. And that is that they have more snakes than we do. So uh, we posted on the Cornell website a picture of one of my nest boxes and the comments that came in immediately. Well, you're going to get a snake in that box. You need a guard. So out here on the West Coast, I view hanging nest boxes as more predator proof than uh, a mounted box. When I took over a trail at, at IBM Research Center, they had a lot of mounted nest boxes. And uh, one of the first boxes is I was delighted when I saw a chickadee nesting in one of the boxes. And uh, a couple of weeks later, when I again checked the box, the box had been predated by a raccoon. So if you can get the box you know, off the ground, uh, hanging in a tree, it'd be much harder for a, uh, a raccoon to get up into a tree and you can deliberately hang it out on, on a, a thinner branch. Um, I know that I do have predation. In the one case I showed you, a gopher snake had crawled up uh, the trunk of a tree across on a branch and dropped down into a box. So yes, it's possible for snakes to get into the box, but um, as far as ground predators, I consider it more predator proof. I do get predation and I showed pictures of where mice are able to get into the boxes. I get mice uh, mostly down at Cinnabar Hills Golf Club where they have a lot of uh, coast live oak trees. So the coast live oak trees are really, really brushy. Uh, because of that, I also get house wrens down there. So I get predation from mice and predation from uh, house wrens. Now, as far as house wrens go, some people would tell you if you have house wrens, move your boxes. Uh, that's some areas they've literally taken, house wrens have really readily taken over uh, areas on the East Coast, for example, where you used to have Buick wrens. They don't have Buick wrens anymore, they have house wrens. They're, they're more aggressive. So uh, I, I do like hanging boxes. Uh, as far as a predator guard, if I'm able to get to a section later on, I can show you the kinds of predator guards that I use on, on my hanging nest boxes. All right, and um, let's see, Erica wants to know if, you, if we don't already have nest boxes, what time of year is best to put them up? Well, the, the passerine boxes, you would want them up, uh, I would say by February 1st, because they start nesting in March. But the earlier you get them up, I'm sorry, uh, some of the passerines start nesting in March. But the earlier you get them up, the more chance they have to be noticed. Uh, one of your questions talked about bluebirds were in the area. And I've already seen bluebirds looking in my nest boxes. So uh, they're aware the nest boxes are here, but it is not time for them to nest. Um, so anyway, uh, by February 1, but earlier if you can get them up. Great. And Molly asked how frequently you check your boxes. And I think you said about once a week, right? Uh, once a week, yes. Uh, there are cases where I might have a problem. If I see a problem, I might even go back the very next day, for example, depending on, on, on what the problem is. But uh, on average, once during the nesting season, once a week during the nesting season. Great. And Florence wants to know, if you have more than one bluebird box, how far apart should they be? 
Well, uh, if you write it up, some people, if you looked online, some people would tell you 50 yards, 100 yards apart. But I have them working uh, 35 yards apart, for example. Uh, and the reason for that, well, I think they're even close to that, closer than that, um, uh, 20 some yards. And what it depends on is the availability of food. If there's enough food around for everybody, there's no need to fight over the food. And it also depends upon what's, uh, what's between the two boxes. The two boxes that I mentioned, I think it's actually around 20, 25 yards apart. Uh, there's trees in between. One box can't see the other box. So, uh, but I would not put up a whole bunch of boxes that are real close together, you know, uh, put up boxes and, and get a feel for uh, what's the nesting activity. Uh, tree swallows, again, you can put them back, back to back, but people would say, well, put them 10 feet apart. And in the one case, I showed a photo of where I had uh, tree swallows, uh, three boxes in a tree. Uh, tree swallows use two of the boxes um, and western bluebirds use the other. So different species, but they're not competing for the same food source. The tree swallows are flirting through the air, picking insects out of the air, whereas the bluebirds fly down on the ground and pick uh, insects off the ground. Oh, interesting. And uh, in terms of ventilation and keeping the box cool, um, Nora wants to know, how would you know if your box was too hot and what signs should you look for? Well, uh, what I do is I carry an infrared therm thermometer around with me <clears throat> because uh, when, the, when I have eggs, uh, I may see eggs in a box week after week and I start having the question as well, are the eggs being incubated? And using the infrared thermometer, you can uh, shoot the egg and, and get the temperature of the egg. It should be something above ambient temperature, uh, typically in the upper 80s, uh, 90s. So you can use that same infrared thermometer to shoot the insides of the boxes. And if you read up about uh, what can survive with high temperatures in an S box, I've read that uh, if you get an in internal temperature of 105 degrees, nothing can survive in the box. So um, that's why I hang my boxes uh, in the, sh so they're shaded at noon and in the, in the hot afternoon. It's actually the hot afternoon, four o'clock that uh, we get the highest temperatures. So keep it in the shade if you can, uh, make sure you have flow through ventilation. In my boxes, um, we have a one half inch gap between the, the sides, the two opposing sides and uh, the top of the box. Now flow through ventilation only works if you have a breeze. So another reason to keep the box in the shade if you can. Great, and then one last question before we can have you continue. So Molly wants to know if you have resources for determining which species are appropriate for one's area and habitat. Well, this uh, monitoring guide that I mentioned, uh, it was actually a monitoring guide by uh, Graham Hatch. I forget if it's Hatch Graham or Graham Hatch. He talks about the, the various habitats that uh, uh, you can expect uh, various species of birds in. So I mentioned that uh, in some areas where I have coast live oaks, lots of twigs, uh, brushes with lots of twigs, I get uh, house wrens. Uh, Western bluebirds love short green grass. Cemeteries, uh, city parks, uh, golf clubs are ideal for Western bluebirds. They will perch someplace and they will swoop down to the grass and pick up insects. Swallows uh, flirt through the air. So what I try to do is, well, where where uh, am I gonna have a lot of insects? Uh, gee, I have a, a county park down here that has a great big lake, or I'm at a golf club that has the sprinklers running every day, uh, should be lots of insects. So you can kind of guess what, what uh, habitat will reap uh, the various species. But again, uh, what I could do is send you a link, uh, Serena, to the monitoring guide and you could circulate that. There, there's additional information like Cornell has an abundance of information talking about uh, uh, the birds showing pictures of the various species of birds, what their nesting habitats are, 
uh, nest structure, number of eggs, etc. There's a wealth of information at, at uh, Cornell. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, and Mike uh, added that it's Hatch Graham, and don't forget that the California Bluebird Recovery Program, Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and Sequoia Audubon all have nest box programs. So those are also great resources. So I'm, I'm happy to send all of those out to everybody after um, after the talk. So um, with that, I think you can go ahead and continue with your talk. Uh, I hope I won't be keeping you up too long. Um, <clears throat> so what, what we have here, in this section I'm going to be talking about lo losses. Why do I have losses? And on the left here I have uh, evidence of usurping. The bottom of the nest may have been a tree swallow nest. A, uh, House wren moved in, started building a nest, and then the tree swallows came back and, and uh, built on top of the house wren. Now, unfortunately, um, this usurping can sometimes result in the death of the original occupant. On a few occasions, I find a dead bird in there, and another bird is building a nest, even on top of the dead bird. So here's another interesting case where I have uh, two different species eggs in the same box in the same nest. Here I have Ashford flycatcher eggs. And if you look at the, the makeup of the nest, it was an Ashford flycatcher nest. And the Western bluebird came in and laid eggs right on top of it. Western bluebird was really anxious to drop eggs. So she popped it in the box and dropped a couple eggs. Now this introduces the problem here is, okay, what if all these eggs hatch? You have Ashford flycatchers that the adults will teach to feed one way and you have Western bluebirds, the adults will teach to feed another way. I was actually prepared that should these bluebird eggs hatch, I would take the nestlings and put them into another box uh, with Western bluebird nestlings in it. So up here, we again, we have a tree, uh, we had a uh, Ashford flycatcher nest and then the tree swallows moved in and laid their eggs. Here's the case of a, a tree swallow nest and the bluebird popped in and laid eggs. So, <clears throat> This, this is kind of rare, but it's kind of interesting. This happened two years ago when I had this occurring and my good friend Steve Simmons also found it. He actually had uh, two species in the box and both species eggs hatch, but the, the one, one of the species uh, died. So it, it didn't turn out to be a problem for him what to do with the uh, one nestling. And again, at, at the end of every season, I kind of look at what, I lost so many eggs, I lost so many nestlings, what happened? So this is what happened in 2020. I lost a total of 270 eggs. Uh, 45 of the eggs were abandoned, some of them were broken, uh, some of them were missing, and that may be predation by the house ram, and some of them simply didn't hatch, they were uh, infertile. So abandoned eggs uh, differs from unhatched in that the entire clutch of eggs was abandoned. When we look at uh, 2020, what happened to the nestlings, we had abandoned nestlings. Again, all of the nestlings were dead in the box and the adults were not around for whatever reason. Here I find individuals that had died. Over here I found individuals that are missing. So that could be because of predation, but it could also be that the nestling, uh, the hatchling died and the adult removed it. And the adults are able to remove this net dead nestlings until they get too big. And then um, that's when I do it. So this is 2020 and this is typical. These bar, bars may go up and down uh, depending upon the weather, for example, uh, from year to year. But in 2019, we see something unusual here. We see 519 dead nestlings. What happened in 2019? And when we look at bluebirds over the years, uh, the green here is the percent overall. So if you're a bluebird egg, uh, what are your chances of, of hatching? And you can see that remains fairly steadle, steady, averaging out to be almost 70% over these years. So uh, way back when here, uh, it was real good because in 2002, I only had four eggs and they all hatched and they all fled. So I had 100%. But Again, this is fairly stable here. Some ups and down, but it's a narrow band. When we look at tree swallows here, uh, there's more up and downs to it. And if we look at 
uh, two particular years here, we look at 2019 and 2020, we can see a vast difference. Notice here between uh, the number of tree swallows eggs that hatched and the number that fledged, an enormous gap here. What happened to that gap? We have a difference here, but it's, it's not as great. So in uh, 2020, we had 71% of the hatchings fledged. And in 2019, only 54.5% of the hatchings fledged. What happened? Well, uh, what we found, what we had, what we experienced is a rain, an unusual rain in 2019. And I knew, I knew that the weather can drastically affect nesting results, but in 2019, this is the worst case that I've ever seen. In 2019, we had a storm come in and for days it dropped rain. And some of those rainfalls were up to over uh, maybe seven tenths, six and a half uh, tenths of an inch. Um, so rain, rain uh, lasted for days. And then we had wind. So this is a, a chart showing how windy it was. And yes, the wind blew here on uh, the wind run on uh, June 2nd was 116 miles. And wind run is if you throw a balloon up in the air, how far will it travel in 24 hours? It went 116.6 miles. So this data is coming from uh, Cinnabar Hills Golf Club, which is my tree swallow factory. If we look at uh, tree swallow losses, well, first of all, nesting. So these are tree swallow nesting for the head in the box. It drops off. But here's tree swallow uh, nesting losses. After the storm, I went out and checked my boxes. And uh, that day, I removed over 250 dead tree swallow nestlings. The weather prevented the adults from, from uh, catching insects. They flirt about the air, take the insects out of the air. And if it's windy and raining, the insects are gonna stay down. They'll be lucky if they're able to feed themselves, much less nestlings. So I removed over 250 nestlings and uh, some of the nestlings were, were weak, but still alive. I left those nestlings in the boxes and I felt they wouldn't, they wouldn't make it. And yes, they didn't make it. They came back the next week and, and indeed they died. But what I did with the uh, dead nestlings is I removed the whole nest, took the whole nest out of the box and uh, came back the next week. And on several cases, I had tree swallow nests in there with brand new eggs in. So they're programmed to reproduce. In a single week, they're able to build a nest and uh, begin laying eggs. So in the cases where the, not all of the nestlings had died, they were dead. Uh, the next visit, I removed their nest and I saw the same thing again. So what we're seeing here is, is the second clutch uh, of tree swallows. And what we're seeing over here is a typical loss of tree swallows near the end of the season. When we get into uh, late June, July, August, uh, the insect population really plummets and I get a lot of tree swallow losses. Bluebirds are, are less affected because here I had, you can see bluebird losses here. Yes, I had some losses, but it's not a steep curve. Even though it may be windy, windy and, and raining, the insect, uh, the bluebirds uh, can, can they pick the insects off, off the ground and the vegetation. And in some cases, uh, as I mentioned, they will even uh, feed their nestlings or elderberries. So tree swallows weren't even affected by it because they they had nestlings sort of near the end. The first nestlings were found near the sort of uh, near the end of the uh, the storm. So weather can have a really really dramatic impact on the nesting success. And on this last chart here, what I show is the accumulated number of nestlings between these three species. Uh, accelerated curve here because of the tree swallow losses up here is typical end of season. Uh, losses. Okay, and then uh, I promised someone I would show them a predator guard. So here's a predator guard. Someone asked a question about a squirrel and what I talked about it is an acrylic portal. So here, uh, this particular nest box, uh, it's a good nest box. Year after year, I have western bluebirds move in and uh, have two clutches of eggs, a very successful box. But I started having trouble because of the acorn woodpecker. In this particular golf course, uh, trees are dying. So here we have softwood uh, for the woodpeckers uh, to bang on. 
but this one particular woodpecker really loved my boxes. So I put the predator guard around the entrance hole, it's, it's acrylic. And but what they're still able to do is they're still able to get their head into the hole and they will carve away at, at the wood that they can get into get at. They even bore holes, uh, peck away on the side. So what I did is I put a plastic sheeting around the box. If they can't get purchase on the box, they can't bang away on the box. In this case here, he was still able to hang from the entrance hole, uh, bang away, and I actually brought the box back and I put a piece of one inch steel pipe, a short tote, a short stub of pipe, one and a half inch inside diameter in here. So by God, that if he's done damage to that uh, uh, steel pipe, I'm gonna be impressed. But what I'm trying to do is keep him away from the box and allow the Western bluebirds to use it. Over here, uh, I mentioned the problem that I have with mice. So here's, here's a hanging uh, predator guard and it, it's still, I'm on about three different kinds of designs, but per, the, re, the reason what I'm trying to accomplish here is if something comes uh, down the, the hanging wire here, this is an unstable surface. It's a large piece of plastic that's balanced by this uh, short piece of PCD pipe. So if I put my finger on here and push down, the whole thing would tip and whatever is on it, hopefully would slide off to the side. So this is what I'm trying to do with mice. <clears throat> if mice happen to get on the box and if they want to get off, they're gonna either have to drop down to the ground or jump to the tree. So if I use this kind of a predator guard on a box, I have to make sure that I hang it out of jumping range for mice. So uh, I've had good success with it, uh, but I'm still trying to come up with something uh, better. I, uh, for example, if the wind blows, if the wind blows, this, this tips up here at a high angle and mice could still get into the box. So I'm trying to limit the motion of, of the uh, unstable cover. Uh, oops, we talked about um, uh, predator guards and what do, we, what do you do to keep uh, house sparrows out of a box? The first time I had house sparrows in the box, I went online and read, well, what can you do about house sparrows? And there was a discussion of using monoline, uh, fishing line to uh, make the box predator guard, uh, predator, more predator safe. And uh, what they actually did is from the front of the box, they strung monoline down to the ground. From the edges of the roof, they strung monoline down and tied bolts on the end of it. But uh, that's all too complicated. So what I did is I, I made a portal that I can replace. And what I have here is standoff wires uh, that basically put the monoline about an inch from the surface of the portal. And what I do is I, I, because it's on wire here, I can actually adjust the tension of the line and the distance of the line. What you want to do is you want to have the monoline maybe a quarter inch from the inside from the edges of, of the uh, entrance hole. So from the edge of the hole, edge of the entrance hole in is where you want the model line. And you can even go more than that. And though I've not seen it work, people say it works. And apparently what happens with the house sparrow is the house sparrow approaches the box, his wing encounters the line, he backs off, he may try to go in the box again, his wing again encounters the line and he gives up going in. So, uh, but I've not had any problems with any species that I want into the box. It's the way they approach the box. The, the bluebird just flies in, tucks its wing in, and shoots into the box. And it is house sparrow resistant. If you had a house sparrow in the box and you then put them on the line on, the house sparrow would probably still get into the box. So it's a, uh, you want to do it before you have house sparrows. But uh, of the plans I have on my website, this is the most popular plan. Uh, how to build, how to make this box of sparrow resistant. The very first time I used it, I had a trail in a, in a uh, cemetery and on one end of the cemetery, they had a tile roof. It was kind of a, a Japanese area of the cemetery. They had a tile, a couple of buildings with tile roofs and the house sparrows were nesting under the tiles. I mean, almost adjacent uh, under the tiles. So what I did is I hung a couple of bluebird boxes there. I invited house sparrows to use the box. And 
lo and behold, what do I find in the box? I find the Western Bluebirds. So uh, I put the monoline on the box and the Western Bluebird for a couple of years in a row, they fledged uh, successfully, no problem with house bearings. And I, th I then gave the trail away. But two interesting things here is one is that I was probably 10 feet from where the tiles were. And earlier I had made a statement that if the house sparrow wants the box, it will kill anything in the box. There were so many tiles around, so many openings under tiles that they probably had a nest, enough nesting cavities, they didn't need another nesting cavity. So if you have house problems with house sparrows, you might try that. And there is a, uh, another device called a sparrow spooker, which uh, mounts on the back of the box, basically a rod that sticks high up in the air, another rod that goes over the top of the box, and it has uh, t tailings of mylar that, that blow in the wind. And because mylar is very shiny, it's, uh, it's, it's a spooker, it spooks the sparrows. So you can use either or both of these techniques if you're having problems with house sparrows. So uh, I mentioned Cornell Lab. Uh, I have a, uh, a code here that can be scanned and it will take you right to uh, the Cornell website, but they have a lot of interesting sections. Uh, Nestwatch was mentioned earlier, and Nestwatch is where I re report my nesting data. And in total, I think it's between 4,500 and 5,000 nesting records that I've reported to them. Uh, and what nesting records are is interesting information, uh, like when was the first egg laid, what species, what brood is it, when did the eggs hatch, uh, how many eggs hatch, uh, when did they fledge, how many fledge. So that's the kind of statistics that they, they are looking for. And on my website, I have uh, photos and videos and uh, plans for various plans here. I have plans for my bluebird nest box if you're interested. Also have plans for barn owl box. Uh, anyway, all these plans are right on, on the nest boxes. A couple of these items we'll talk about next week when we get into the raptors. So that's it. Uh, sorry, I kept everybody so long. Well, Serena, okay. are you still there? Yeah. Um, yeah, do thank you, have, you so much. Do you have your jammies on? <laughs> About to, but um, we do have a few more questions if you sure. don't mind uh, sure, don't getting mind to this. I don't okay. mind at all. <laughs> and then let me just share my last slide too so that um, people know to come back next week for the second part of your talk. Um, give me just a second. Okay, so um, a couple people asked if brown-headed cowbirds are ever a problem in our area laying eggs in nest boxes. Yes, my wife, the birder, uh, does see cowbirds and sometimes sees a, a juvenile cowbird uh, amongst other uh, species of birds. So yes, they are around, but they're not a problem in my nest boxes. And Anne wants to know if you are looking to increase the population of Western bluebirds? <laughs> I'm trying as hard as I can. Uh, I mentioned that Santa Teresa Golf Club is my bluebird factory. And uh, since last year, I've even added a couple of more boxes. Um, uh, tremendous success there. Cinnabar Hills Golf Club, I used to have more bluebirds than I have now, but what is happening over time is the tree swallows are coming in earlier and earlier. When I first encountered tree swallows, I would start tree, I would see tree swallows looking for nesting cavities at a time that Western bluebirds had nestlings. So they would come in weeks after uh, bluebird nesting activity started. Now what I'm seeing is tree swallows are coming in at the same time bluebirds are. So there's a uh, competition for uh, nesting cavities and some of the boxes that I had bluebirds nest year after year after year and now getting tree swallows in. Well, the fix for that is to put up more bluebird boxes if I can uh, to give the uh, bluebirds uh, an opportunity for to find the cavity. Do you think the tree swallows are coming in earlier for any particular reason? Could it be climate or something else? I, I would uh, attribute it to climate change. 
All right. Well, I think that is the last question that we, oh, actually, sorry, I accidentally missed a question. Um, Lois asked, do, do Buick's wrens destroy eggs like house wrens do? I've not experienced that, but I found uh, when I researched that topic, the answer was yes. But it may not be to the volume that the house sparrow does it. But I don't get enough Buick's wrens to to really form an opinion how frequent it is. We get uh, uh, Buick's wrens, for example, in our backyard. Last year we had a uh, Buick's wren that had two clutches in the nest box. This year we didn't have. So I, I would like to have more, but it, uh, Buick's wren is a good backyard bird along with uh, chestnut back chickens. Yeah, they are. Well, I think that was, that's all the questions. So again, thank you everybody for coming, for tuning in and staying extra long for a birdie hour today, birdie two hours today. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you as well, Lee. We're looking forward to hearing more from you next week. Is there anything else you want to say to everybody before we all sign off? Well, if you're still with me, I appreciate your, your hanging in there. Uh, I had warned Serena beforehand that when I give these presentations in person, I, I remind people that they need to have a sharp stick to keep me on schedule and to force me off the, the stage at the end. But uh, with Zoom, that was not impossible. All right, thank you. And um, Anne, just really quickly before we sign off, Anne wants to know where you get your boxes. And as I understand it, you build them, right? Uh, most of my boxes I built, yes. And uh, it, uh, takes about uh, 50 minutes to build a box. If, if you want to look at my plans, uh, my plans are very detailed and I do a lot of extras to the box. Like if you saw the entrance hole in uh, my last slide uh, where I was showing the monoline, uh, I, I, I route it out, I make it nice and smooth. So, it takes me about 50 minutes to make a box. And if you're looking at plywood, I use three quarter inch plywood. I can bring the box cost uh, less than $5 a box. But uh, I'm running uh, 470 boxes. So in reality, I'm not looking to make more boxes. All right, and then um, I think I can find your plans online and send those out to everybody. Um, so I hope that helps, Anne. And then uh, uh, really quickly, Zane asked if bees nest in them too. Uh, bees will. I showed the one slide where we had, uh, well, two sli one slide where we had uh, hornets in the box and wasps. <clears throat> but in one case, down at Cinnabar Hills Golf Club, I had uh, bluebird nestlings in the box. I knew they were in the box. Uh, I came to check it and there were bees going in and out of the box. So yes, bees will move into the box. Uh, in that case, I managed to open the box up and all of the nestlings were dead in the box. I closed the box up and uh, came back weeks later. But that, that was only the only instance I've ever had of bees uh, getting into a box. Hornets uh, can be a problem. Uh, if you're dealing with hornets, uh, you want to visit the boxes in the cool of the morning because in the cooler temperatures, they're not very mobile. You come back uh, later in the hot afternoon and, and they flirt about and uh, can be threatening. All right. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it for the night. So thanks again, Lee, and we'll see you next Thursday. All right, everybody have fun. And again, thank you all. Appreciate it.